half of the session. We have two more talks, and then we'll have a discussion uh, where all the speakers will come back up and we'll have a panel. Um, and so for this talk, we have Annie Boibonet from um, Huey, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, too easy. And she's going to talk about nitrogen loss um, in oxygen deficient zone um, mesoscale eddies. Uh, our uh, German collaborator, Lothar Srema and Hermann Benge, we invited us on two uh, scientific expeditions at sea. Um, and I have to acknowledge there is many student and technician that was involved uh, in this project. But in our team, I have to acknowledge uh, Shawulit Net, Sharon Pong, everybody knows Net. Uh, he's now a student, uh, a joint program student, but he, analyzed perhaps, he collected and analyzed perhaps a thousand samples. And uh, Jennifer Larkham, who also analyzed greatly with sample analysis. So now we care about nitrogen because it's an essential macronutrient in the ocean. Uh, so that has implication for CO2 sequestration and primary productivity and climate change also. So uh, it's the balance um, between sinks here and source of bioavailable or fixed nitrogen that control its uh, availability in the ocean. So the main sinks of nitrogen, fixed nitrogen, are the uh, denitrification here. So the conversion of nitrate to uh, N2 gas. There is also NMOX, the conversion of ammonium and uh, nitride to N2. And the main source is uh, N2 fixation in the ocean. So although um, oxygen deficient zone only occupy a small uh, percentage of the oceanic volume, uh, 30 to 50% of the global fixed end loss occur in these regions. So the main oxygen uh, deficient zone that I will call ODZs uh, are located in the Eastern Tropical North and South Pacific and the Arabian Sea. So here, there, some scientists attempted to constrain the global end budget. Um, here, Kadispadi uh, estimated that um, the end budget was uh, grossly unbalanced with about like 200 teragram per year uh, more sinks than source. So that would mean that the ocean is denitrifying and could have important uh, implications for primary productivity over long term. Uh, where uh, uh, Nicolas Gruber's team uh, more recently claimed that the, um, the global marine uh, nitrogen budget is more in balance. So I don't know if it's still a good idea to invite uh, both at the same party, but <laughs> what, I do, uh, what I do want to point your attention on is that there is a huge uncertainty. Well, first of all, there is a huge uncertainty associated with all the, those terms, but more particularly for uh, benthic nitrogen loss. Um, so this is, this is so because it's temporally and specially variable. So uh, right now, the estimate varies anywhere from uh, 68 to more than 300 teragram per year and representing uh, 65 to 75 percent of uh, the total end loss. So one way that we can use to uh, estimate, better estimate the proportion of uh, benthic uh, end loss uh, over total end loss is using stable isotopes. So here, just for the, the ones that are not used to use, uh, the, that are not used to stable isotope, we use stable isotope to um, study biological processes because during biological reaction, the organism um, use the lighter isotope, enriching the substrate in the heavier isotopes. And we use the delta notation, which compare the ratio 15N, 14N of a sample to the ratio of a standard uh, multiplied by 1,000 because those deviations are rather small. So here, I just want to give an example. The numbers are not specifically accurate, but I just want to give an example of how we could estimate sedimentary uh, end loss uh, by isotope mass balance. So we first, um, let's say, if we assume that the average at 15 of marine nitrate uh, of which is about five per mil, they didn't change significantly during the Holocene. Um, uh, so the, the source and its isotopic composition will need to balance the sink and uh, the flux, both in flux and isotopic composition. So we need to know the isotope effect of water column um, and loss, which is about uh, 25 per mil. So if 
from there, we can calculate uh, by substituting in this equation here, uh, we can calculate the delta N15 of biogenic N2, which is about minus 20 per mil for N loss. And in the sediment, the isotope effect is suppressed because uh, nitrate is uh, mostly, uh, all, mostly are all consumed in the sediment and also because of diffusion limitation. So they estimate an isotope effect of about 1.5 per mil uh, in the sediment. So from there, we can calculate 3.5 per mil for the delta N15 biogenic N2 associated with the sedimentary identification or N loss. Um, we know that N2 fixation of a delta 15N of about, added delta 15N of about uh, minus one per mil because that process doesn't fractionate significantly. So now if we uh, take those, uh, the term for water column and loss and um, N2 fixation, uh, the, the average estimate that I showed earlier, um, in order to isotopically balance that budget, we would need more than 200 teragram N per year using this approach. So that's, that's uh, rather high and it's difficult with such a high flux of sedimentary denitrification to balance the N budget. So, of course, like I said, um, it's difficult to estimate these terms because of special and temporal variability. Uh, and more recently, uh, more in theme with the, the, this session, uh, uh, Altabet et al. observed um, that eddy could be a nitrogen loss hotspot. So, uh, and later there was several other, uh, other studies that supported this. So that was an important study um, because lots, we know a lot about primary productivity and the role of ED for primary productivity, but uh, little, has been, little, little research has been done on a uh, mesoscale ED uh, role for nitrogen loss in biogeochemistry. So in this, this uh, 2012 study, um, here I show section at the uh, isopycnol 26.3, which is in, well within the ODZ. So uh, in the oxygen minimum. So what Altabet et al. in 2012, they, what they observe is, um, I will show for that station X here. So that station is not shown, uh, but it was at the edge of the anticyclonic mesoscale uh, eddy. So what they observe is like higher uh, nitrite concentration, uh, higher um, N, uh, what they call N uh, prime, so N, and prime is here is the DIN deficit, which is the DIN concentration expected based on red field stoichiometry minus the dissolved inorganic nitrogen concentration observed or measured. So I uh, DIN deficit, and also I delta 15N of nitrite, uh, nitrate. So that makes sense because, um, like I said, during the biological reaction, the organism will um, fractionate uh, the substrate. So the uh, the nitrate should be enriched and that uh, should be, um, should have an I delta in 15. So that was the first evidence that uh, eddies could act as a N an N loss hotspot in the ocean. But you will tell me that's just as oh, at one station, uh, so it was limited evidence and we need to, uh, we need that to, to get, to, to obtain more uh, measurement to confirm that. So uh, for this reason, there was more cruise uh, or uh, expedition organized um, of Peru, and that was part of the SFB uh, 754 Climate Biogeochemistry Interaction in the Tropical Ocean uh, with a German collaborator at Guillomar in Kiel. So they invited Mark's group to participate to two uh, crews of Peru. Uh, one was in November 2012 and the other in December 2012. And the November 2012 cruise was specifically designed to uh, survey eddies. So three eddies were observed. Here is the sea surface height anomaly. So I will talk more about those different types of eddy in the next slide. Uh, in December 2012, we, uh, the main goal of the cruise was not to survey eddies, but we did uh, deviate it from the cruise track a little bit because we wanted to resample that eddy that was about one month old, uh, one month older at the time, so about three months old. So um, 
from looking at density structure and ADCP data, we were able to, uh, they were able to determine that the anticyclonic eddy, both A and B here, were in fact mold water anticyclone. So mold water anticyclone are characterized by a um, displacement of the lens shape displacement of the isopycnol here. And of course, uh, the element of welling at the surface causes uh, positive sea surface uh, anomaly for the anticyclone. Uh, the cyclone here C was characterized by, characterized by negative sea, surf, uh, sea surface anomaly and uh, also uh, upward displacement of the isopycnol. So here, both type of eddy could theoretically um, increase primary productivity um, because the, of the uh, injection of nutrient in the ophytic zone. So now we'll show some results uh, from observational data that we, we have. Uh, here is the oxygen concentration for eddy A, and in overlay I have the um, isopycnol. So uh, that's a profile depth section distance along the, the section here. So what we can see here is that uh, uh, for the anticyclone, Eddie, uh, the, there is an um, injection of oxygen. Like you can see the lens shape form typical for the mold water eddy, and you can see that there is injection of low uh, oxygen water in the, uh, for, uh, in the surface water. If we look now at the chlorophyll, um, so you can see that the, the three types of eddy, there was uh, accumulation of chlorophyll near the center of the eddy, uh, but the accumulation of chlorophyll was uh, significantly higher uh, for the coastal, uh, more coastal eddy. So, um, so because this is the um, eddy A here is where we observe the highest accumulation of chlorophyll, and also, also this is where we observe the highest end loss. Um, I will focus on this eddy for the next slide. So. For the EDA, we observe uh, these, these are nitrite concentrations. So uh, nitrite is, remember, it's an intermediate during nitrogen loss. So we observe a concentration of up to like 12 micromole per liter in the center, near the center of the eddy compared to 5 micromole per liter uh, outside uh, the eddy. So there was clear accumulation, of, uh, increased concentration of nitrite near the center of the eddy. Nitri nitrate was almost completely consumed uh, near the center of the eddy because it was uh, because of nitrogen loss processes. Um, that time 15 of nitrate up to 70 per mil. So that's really high. Uh, it's one of the highest value reported for offshore, uh, the offshore water column. So that makes sense because if nitrate is all consumed, then it will, the, the remaining substrate would be high in the time 15. I, I, we'll have an I that I'm 15. So now the DIN deficit was up to 40 micromole N per liter near the center of the AD again. So that really clearly showed that the, this mesoscale AD can uh, enhance end loss or be end loss uh, hotspot. Uh, Biogenic N2, which we, ca we calculated uh, this from uh, N2 argon ratio, so was also up to 40 micromole N per liter. So the biogenic N2 is the N2 produce, um, is, a, is a product of uh, N loss. Now if we look at the delta N15 of biogenic N2, it varied from about minus 15 to 5 per mil. So uh, that makes sense because the average delta N15 of nitrate, it's about, um, it's about 5 per mil in the ocean. So if you consume all the nitrate, you will expect no net fractionation. So about 5 per mil, you should have a, the 10, 15 uh, N of biogenic N2 should also be close to 5 per mil. So we can use eddies as natural laboratory because of the, U, uh, the wide range in the substrate consumption that we observe and biogenic N2 production, the product. So that's a substrate here. Uh, dissolved in organic nitrogen, nitrate, and nitrite, and that's the product, biogenic N2. And if we plot that N15 dissolved in organic nitrogen versus the fraction of substrate consumption, 
and that time 15 of biogenic N2 versus the fraction of biogenic N2 production. These are called Rayleigh plot. The slope will give you the isotope effect, which is uh, the degree of fractionation uh, for uh, a specific process. So uh, the different nitrogen process has diff uh, different uh, uh, isotope effect. So we get an isotope effect of about uh, 13 to 14 per mil, uh, which is low, uh, uh, relatively low compared to the isotope effect reported for other uh, ODZs of the, between like 20 to 30 per mil. But it's comparable to um, the isotope effect for nitrate reduction calculated by Riebenko et al. in the same, uh, in the uh, Eastern Tropical South Pacific of, uh, of Peru. Uh, so in the same region of, um, that was 16 per mil. So that was not in the eddy. So. so now if we come back to the figure I've shown earlier. Uh, we calculated that uh, if we assume that uh, isotope effect for uh, N loss in the water column at 25 per mil, we calculated that we will need more, uh, a big flux of sedimentary denitrification of more than 200 teragram N per year to isotopically uh, balance the budget. But if now we have a lower uh, isotope effect of 13 per mil, we redo the calculation, we'll need only 70 teragram N per year to isotopically balance the budget. So I'm not claiming here that there is a low isotope effect everywhere in all the ODZ, but what the, the point I want to, uh, to uh, convey here is that if you have a lower isotope effect in, like let's say the ETSP for some reasons, uh, you need less sedimentary uh, denitrification to balance the, uh, the global marine uh, end budget. So now I look at some possible mechanism for enhanced nitrogen loss in eddies. So the first hypothesis uh, is that the high nitrogen loss could originate from the productive coast. So um, in what you see in the eddy is not produced in the eddy, it's just a signal from the productive coast. The second hypothesis is that the organic material, the chlorophyll, is trapped during eddy formation near the coast and could support nitrogen loss offshore. And the third hypothesis is, it's been really well reviewed by the previous speaker, it's increased primary productivity and consequently nitrogen loss because we're in the ODZ uh, from mesoscale and some mesoscale processes. So let's look, let's look at the first hypothesis, water transport from the shelf. So there is at least two evidence I could, found, I could find that doesn't support that hypothesis. First, the shallow uh, shelf water have high phosphate and silicate anomalies. For instance, uh, there is, uh, we uh, commonly observe excess phosphate because it's preferentially uh, liberated from the sediment, but we didn't observe uh, such anomalies in um, EDA. So for instance, if we look at plot of biogenic N2, which is not affected by, um, by red field uh, stoichiometry and versus N deficit, which uh, would be affected by preferential uh, phosphate release from the sediment. We see that uh, this relationship is one for one in uh, the eddy, uh, but the, this relationship is not one, uh, it's diff it's, um, not one for one in coastal water. And in coastal water, I just took the station here. Uh, the depth was less than 200 meters. So uh, here, the end deficit is clearly higher than the biogenic N2 because there is preferential, preferential uh, release of um, phosphate. So that's one, one evidence that the, the water that are in the eddy are not just coming from the shelf, like trapped from the shelf. Another uh, evidence I found is that I just talked about the isotope effect. We calculated in the eddy an isotope effect of about 14 per mil, which is similar to uh, other isotope effect for nitrate reduction that calculated uh, of Peru of 16 per mil. But in the, um, in, for coastal station, uh, we calculated an isotope effect of 7 per mil. Um, so that's clearly lower than uh, what we calculated for the uh, offshore, offshore eddy. And this is to be expected. A low isotope effect is expected in the water column of coastal water because it's influenced by the suppressed isotope effect of sedimentary denitrification. So the second hypothesis is that the organic material could be transported 
offshore and support nitrogen loss offshore. So this is possible, and I cannot confirm that hypothesis because, in fact, we did observe the IS uh, chlorophyll concentration near the center of the eddy that was the closest to the shore. So I think it's difficult to disentangle um, uh, the, uh, this, this from, okay, mesoscale, so mesoscale process or um, transport of organic material offshore. The third hypothesis, which is also possible and could explain uh, and end nitrogen loss, would be mesoscale and some mesoscale processes. Uh, like I said, the previous, all previous speaker uh, talked a lot about these processes, so I'm not going to review these, but um, this is supported by a, um, a study, a recent study by Calbeck et al. We have served the IS end loss rate uh, at the edge of the EDA, and they attributed uh, that to enhanced vertical nutrient transport caused by um, EDI uh, submesoscale mechanism at the edge. So. So in the future, so of course there is many questions remaining about the role of uh, EDI for nitrogen loss. Uh, for instance, uh, what, what is the um, effect of aging EDI on nitrogen loss, for instance? Uh, and I think there, there is a need for more studies on the different type of EDIs for nitrogen loss and the process involved in other ODZs as well. Uh, but, but in the future, uh, we would like to use um, language and flow to study end loss in ODZ uh, eddies of Peru because it would be difficult to, to monitor over time an eddy uh, using um, only a ship, ship of, shipboard observations. So uh, we suggest of Peru because uh, there is a high probability to um, observe an eddy there. So this is the language and float. So uh, we will put on these float a gas tension device, uh, a new, that's an improved version of the GTD, which is, is equipped with a Teflon membrane and has also little fins that uh, improve the circulation and the response time. So just to test one of these membranes, I deployed one of these float of, uh, during the P18 um, leg one uh, cruise last uh, November and I deployed it at 16 uh, degrees north of Mexico. And uh, this is through a collaboration with Eric Dazaro and Craig McNeil mostly at University of Washington. So I'm going to just present uh, the preliminary data uh, here. Um, so these are data for the isopycnol at 26.4 uh, or 190 to 220 d bar uh, meter depth about. So. Here we have the excess N2, and I have the equation here, how we calculate the excess N2 from the GTD. So we just subtract the frugacity or in-situ partial pressure of uh, all other gas but nitrogen from the uh, uh, gas tension, the total gas tension. And then to calculate the N2 excess, we use the Henry loss coefficient, uh, solubility <coughs> coefficient, which is function of temperature, salinity, and here I have a term for hydrostatic pressure. So what I would like to point here is the uh, really, really good precision of those measurements. So all the changes uh, can mostly be related to change in temperature and salinity. And what's remarkable, too, is that the float is still there collecting data. So it's been there since last November, and it's still collecting data. So that's a really, uh, that, uh, from these data, we, were, we would um, be able to calculate rates of nitrogen loss, Things like that. So that would be a really interesting project if we uh, we can uh, if we can get funding for that. So I would like to acknowledge all the other people that have been involved in that project as well. Do, yeah, maybe we have time for one question. Yeah, we started a little bit late. We didn't start the three. Questions for Ann? Okay. Well, I could ask. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, 
you're trying to, you, you mentioned there's two possible sources for the organic material in the interior of the eddy that is the source of the nitrogen loss, either being evicted from the coast or uh, upwelled as a result of the mesoscale or uh, submesoscale instabilities. Are, are there some assays that you could do of the uh, organic materials that would be able to distinguish between those two sources of yeah. the biomass? I was talking with Melissa about that just before the talk. And then, I don't know because, you know, that was one of my questions too. And she told me that the next talk would maybe answer that question. Maybe if you look at the... So at the, you, at the, the uh, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> if you look, I, I guess if you look at the chlorophyll, the different species... The, the could, species could, composition might yeah. say something about it, or the isotopic composition, yeah. some measurements. Well, I don't know too. if the isotopic composition will tell you something, because I don't think we understand, like, completely all the different species of phytoplankton fractionate. Like, okay, it's, it would be difficult to, to get something from it. But I think the best way would be to look at the species composition and, uh, yeah, the kind of work that the next speaker is doing, I think. Right. So. Great. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Let's give her one more hand. <laughs>